Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. I am happy to have Automotive Seminars as a sponsor for the show. Now, if you're not familiar, Automotive Seminars is a diagnostic technician training company. They've got a website that there'll be a link to in the show notes. And what they offer is top-notch training to technicians like us in the field. I've been taking their training courses for years and have got a ton of benefit out of it. they got top-notch instructors, John Thornton, Scott Shotton, Scott Manna. And every other month, they've got a two-night course that you can sign up for. Join in, ask questions, and afterwards, you've paid for the course, you can access a recorded version whenever you want. You can rewatch the class two years later in case you wanted some details on it. And that is a fantastic feature. So make sure to check out the website to see what courses they have available and what's coming up in the future. This episode is brought to you by L1 Automotive Training and Keith Perkins. If you're looking for education on module programming, J2534, EEPROM work, key and immobilizer, electrical diagnostics, or drivability diagnostics. Keith has a website, l1training.com, that's got over 60 hours of training videos on all those subjects and more. When I first started out doing mobile, I utilized Keith's videos on module programming and J2534 in order to get my head wrapped around what I would need for the tooling, the computers, the software setups, you know, what kind of obstacles I would be up against when I'm out there programming modules on cars. And it was a huge benefit to me. And I continue to use the training videos um, that he has on his website. So I strongly recommend checking out l1training.com. The link is in the show notes. Hey, what's going on, automotive world? Welcome to another episode of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I'll be your host once again for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining me and listening to the show. This week on the show, I'm going to tell you why the ohm meter is an awesome tool and why I love it. Um, I've uh, talked about the old meter plenty of times before on the podcast. You probably heard my opinion on it. I use it all the time. And there's a lot of people who don't like the old meter for valid reasons. Um, and it definitely has gotten a bad rap in our industry. And I was kind of thinking about this. Uh, it was at vision uh, last week and it was excellent and excellent classes and really enjoyed it. Um, but you kind of hear, that same thing when it comes to testing in various circumstances of, you know, why the O meter should be th thrown in the trash. Right. <laughs> and um, I'm here to defend the, the lowly O meter in automotive testing. And I, I really do like the tool for what it does well. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about here too, is understanding where this shines and where it doesn't. That's the key. And I'm going to make the argument that it has a place in your, you know, testing equipment repertoire, that there is a reason to have an ohm meter and to use it on a regular basis. At least I do. But anyways, let's get into it here. Um, there's other tools out there and other test methods out there that some people will label as bad or wrong you know, you shouldn't use that test method. You shouldn't use that piece of equipment. And again, some of the is legit. Like some of it's like, that's not a worthwhile method of testing, or that's not a tool that really is going to get you anywhere uh, with automotive testing. Uh, one example I can think of, and I bought one of these and uh, who knows, maybe I'm not using it right, but it was the fault finder. And there's some number to it as well. But really what it is, is you connect it to a circuit in question that you're looking, 
that you suspect has an open, or maybe you've determined has an open, and you can use the second part of the tool to go over the harness, and it's going to tell you where the open is, or it'll it'll light up if there's continuity, and the light will go out if there's not. And I messed around with it for a while. I really wasn't very successful with it. And so I don't think that's really a worthwhile tool. I wouldn't recommend anyone go buy it because it didn't really help me figure anything out that I couldn't with other without other testing methods, right? Like I could use my normal testing methods. That one didn't get me there any sooner. And I didn't see any other real purpose to it. Now, hey, somebody could have more experience with that thing. And they could tell me how it's supposed to work or what I was doing wrong. Very possible. But for me, I, I didn't have much luck with it. But again, maybe there is some useful way that you can utilize that tool. Same thing with the ohm meter and a lot of other tests that we do. Um, power probe is another one. I don't prefer a power probe. I don't use one. But at least with that one, I get where it could be really useful. It's just not in my regular toolkit of tests that I'm going to use, right? And so you can have different opinions on these things and there's different preferences, right? It's all about how you tackle the problem and how you are utilizing and understanding the tool. But that's the key here, right? It's like, I, I've got a whole bunch of different test methods and tools. Um, I use some pretty basic ones for most of my electrical diagnostics, right? I got a meter, I got a little amp clamp, and, you know, I have an amp clamp on a scope, but I'm just talking about the snicker bar size amp clamp. A um, couple of those, a U-scope and a test light. And I get 90% of the stuff that I need done with those. And I'll pull out the Pico and maybe a couple other tools here and there, but that stuff covers most of it. But the reason that I can do as much as I'm able to do with pretty basic tooling is understanding what they can do and what they can't do. Or when we refer to the specific test method that we're using, what is the test capable of telling me? And what is it not capable of telling me? Right. And that's really going to change how useful that tool or test method is to you is understanding its limitations, what it can and can't do. If you're expecting the world from a tool, and it's just not capable of that, well, it's not going to deliver, right? And that's where this ohm meter comes into play because there are things that it is definitely not meant to do. That is not its purpose. But when if we were to treat the tool that way, all of a sudden it's a bad tool. Well, I, I don't think that's fair to the ohm meter to do that because it's true of a lot of other tools as well, right? I absolutely love my test light, right? It's a fantastic tool, but there are certain things that it really can't do for me that other tools can. Like if I want to know amperage, the, the amount of amperage that's going through a circuit, my test light's probably not going to be the tool that I'm going to grab. Um, it, it, same thing for a U-scope, right? Tons and tons and tons of uses for the U-scope. Fantastic little tool. I mean, true for any scope, but there's going to be limitations to what it can do. If I actually want to apply a load to a circuit, well, that U scope's not going to do it for me. That in that case, I'm grabbing my test light, right? So uh, again, it's it's all about understanding what the test or the tool can do for you, and because you're using it incorrectly, doesn't make it a bad tool, right? You can you could take an air hammer and remove dashboard components with it. That that's not the correct use for that tool. You're going to cause a lot of damage and someone might say, well, that's a terrible tool. That air hammer is an awful tool. Look at all the damage you did to the dashboard of this car. Well, you're not supposed to be using it that way, but take it out to the front end suspension. Um, and it, it's an excellent tool, right? I made a ton of money with an air hammer at Firestone. It was a great tool, but again, all about how you use it is going to determine the value of that tool or that test method to you. So today is specifically about the ohm meter, and I'm going to make the argument that if the ohm meter had never existed, no one ever came up with the ohm meter, and someone just invented it today in 2024, I'm saying that everybody out there would be clamoring to get one, right? If a tool 
that measured not only conductivity, give you a visual and an audible warning about said conductivity, and it could measure the specific amount of resistance in something and give you a value. And that hadn't been a thing before. We were doing it manually through calculating voltage drop. Everybody go out and buy one of these things and add it to their test methods, right? Again, it's not going to do everything. You've got a lot of other test methods that are going to prove different things for you. But that one specific, well, I shouldn't say one specific, it's got a couple different uses. Those few uses make it very valuable when you're doing those types of things, right? I won't say it's something that nothing else can do, but there are certain attributes about it that are pretty impressive. I mean, think of it this way, when the pulse sensors really became a thing for measuring changes in manifold pressure or whatever pressure you want to measure, but the the uh, intake and exhaust pulses became a, a pretty big thing a few years back. And everybody was either making and selling or buying these pulse sensors to add to their scope equipment. And while I think it's a really cool tool and you can do some really cool things with it and see some really cool things with it as far as engine mechanical, the, you know, how the engine's breathing and how the pressures are changing in the manifolds, that's really cool stuff. There's limitations to that test and that test method, right? There are things that it definitely can't tell you, or you might think it's telling you and it's not, or there's an extreme amount of variability between engines and the status of the engine. And so then even though it can do a lot for you, there's limitations to it, right? But when it came out and it was kind of this newer thing in the industry, and especially with scope users in the Facebook groups, myself included, everybody was excited to get one. People start making them and people start utilizing them with every, you know, engine mechanical capture. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, again, not saying it's a bad tool, but it's got limitations to what it can do. And I've run into those myself when using it is it's not the only thing that I want to use if I'm trying to diagnose a mechanical issue with an engine, right? I'm also going to integrate some relative compression. I'm going to look at my, my other scope leads, you know, connected to various things like the spark or maybe a cam crank pattern. Of course, it depends on what I'm after exactly, but that goes to serve my point is what exactly am I trying to prove when I'm looking at this engine is a pulse tester, going to prove anything to me? Is it going to be able to show me what I need? And am I going to be able to assess the results of the test correctly? Which sometimes with, you know, various test methods, that's our limitation is we don't understand the results that we're getting. And so again, it doesn't make it a bad test. It's more on us to really have clarity on what our test and test equipment is doing or not doing for us. But I think if this thing didn't exist prior to today, every single person out there would be going out to buy one and add it to their test equipment. So real quick, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because you probably are already aware, but how an ohmmeter works is kind of important to understand where it can be used best. Um, and if you're watching a YouTube video and we do have a YouTube channel, there's a diagram that I made so you can see this, but I'll do my best to explain it so that you can visualize it in your head. Ohmmeter's got two leads coming out of it, right? It's usually in combination with voltmeter, ammeter. It's your multimeter. But when we're on the ohmmeter setting and we have the two leads, the black and the red lead coming out of the meter, going to whatever we want to measure the resistance of, right? Let's just say it's a resistor, okay? So we put the two leads on either side of our we'll say unknown resistor. Maybe you do know it, but a lot of times we don't know. That's why we're measuring. How many ohms of resistance does this relay coil have? Or does this fuse have? Now we know how much it should have. A fuse shouldn't have any, but we're measuring it because we think maybe it's a problem, right? Or this wire. We shouldn't have any resistance in this wire, but let's measure it and see. That's our unknown resistance connected to the lead. So pretty straightforward there. Now, Inside of the meter, it's powered by a 9-volt battery most of the time. 
uh, all of my meters have been just use a nine volt battery and they last forever, which is nice. You don't have to swap them out very often. And I mean, I use mine pretty frequently and those nine volts will last me six months at least, if not more. So anyways, you got a nine volt battery and within the, the board that makes up the internals of the meter, there's going to be a voltage regulator that is going to put a fixed voltage out. And this needs to be a fixed voltage. Otherwise the measurement portion is not going to work. And you can almost kind of think of this uh, the same way that engine computers might measure um, like a, a temperature sensor or a thermistor, right? Um, where they're using a engine coolant temp sensor or an air intake temp sensor. The setup at least the very basic setup that I'm explaining is going to be very similar. And I realize they're probably not exactly the same if you get into the board level components, but the idea is the same. So again, fixed voltage, kind of like you would see a fixed five volt voltage in an ECM that's going to go across a fixed resistor, or they call a shunt resistor, that is within, it's inside of the ohmmeter. Now, the resistance of this is known and it is fixed, right? So the microprocessor that's going to do the calculations in the ohmmeter has a reference of what this resistance is and it's never going to change, right? And it's going to be a pretty low resistance so that it's not going to affect the resistance of the overall circuit that we're measuring. But it is a fixed resistance that we're going to put a fixed low voltage across. And then that is going to go out onto the red lead of the meter, which is going to be connected to whatever you're measuring. Now, on the other side, we've got that connected to the negative side, or you could say the ground um, of the battery. And between, and this is again inside the meter, between what would be the red lead and the black lead is a voltmeter or a volting, voltage measuring device. And so what the ohmmeter is doing is it knows, well, the microprocessor knows the fixed voltage that's going to go out across the fixed resistor and the voltmeter is going to measure it on the other side. Right. So we've had a, if we have a complete circuit, right, if we take our two leads, we touch it across a resistor, we've completed a circuit for that meter, really. We've got voltage and current going through a complete circuit. And it, it's even if you just touch it um, across your body, if you hold it in your left and right hand, you've completed a circuit. It's super, super, super low current, but you've completed a circuit and there is a, amount of voltage that is coming out of on the red lead and it's used to complete that circuit. So anyways, inside of the meter, there's a voltmeter that's going to be measuring that. And whatever that voltage drops to, because the fixed voltage is known and the fixed resistor is known, it can determine the amount of current that is flowing through the circuit, right? It gets a voltage number, and based off of the other factors, it does the calculation and says, okay, this amount of current is flowing through the circuit, okay? And if we know the current and we know the voltage that's being put out, we can calculate what the resistance is. And that's how it calculates what the resistance is of whatever it's measuring, okay? Um, that was my best ability to explain an old meter, especially audio only. Um, if you have a better one, feel free to post it in the group. Um, I made my own little diagram of the inside. I know it's basic. I know it's not complete, but it gives you the, an idea anyways of how the inside of that ohm meter works, right? So we're sending a voltage out. We're dropping it across a resistor within the ohm meter, and then it's going to go out and drop across the measured resistor, whatever we're trying to measure, and then it's going to do the calculation and give us a value, okay? Now, this is a small amount of voltage, and it'll depend on your meter if it's auto ranging or if you have different settings, it will actually change the amount of voltage that it outputs. Um, there's usually a continuity diode test where the voltage is going to be a little bit higher. But then as you change it, if you have like 2K, 20K, 200K, it's also going to change the amount of voltage that it puts out. Um, an auto ranging one will change itself based on what it sees you're connected to. So depends on the meter that you have, but there is a voltage coming out of it 
it is a very small voltage though. There's not a whole lot coming. Again, it's a nine volt battery, so it's limited in that sense, but it's going to be fixed down to around a volt or so, uh, depending on what setting you have it on. Right. And by design, this thing is a low current measuring device, right? We are sending a very, very minimal amount of current onto the circuit in order to measure it, right? We're using a voltage to do that. And I should mention, and you're probably aware, you can't have voltage on the circuit if you're going to measure it. Um, although I did find <laughs> it, doing CAN bus specifically, if the network is quiet, but there's still a bias, right? So we have a two and a half volt bias and it's the same on both sides. You can get an accurate measurement with the ohm meter. Right. I had a vehicle like that the other day, and I think it was because of the network problem. The network would stop talking. There was no more traffic, but the bias voltage would not drop to zero. And I waited at least a few minutes, and I, I usually will look on my meter to see, or my scope or whatever I've got out to see, do I have voltage on the CAN bus before I ohm check it, before I see what the resistance is? Because if the CAN's talking, if it's awake, and there's voltage on there, you're going to get a goofy number because the ohm meter is relying on voltage to do its calculations. And if you add voltage to that circuit, it's going to screw it up. So I was waiting for this voltage to drop. And I was like, well, I, I guess I got to disconnect the battery because I already shut the key off and waited. But I didn't have any actual traffic. I just had the two and a half bias on both circuits. So I was like, well, I'm going to try and just see what happens because I'm lazy. That's literally the only reason I was like, I'm really lazy. I put my meter leads across six and 14 and it gave me the measurement that was a 60 ohms in the case of the one I was looking at. But I was like, that's interesting. If the voltage is the same on both sides, it must still be able to do the calculation. Now I'm sure there's a limit to that. If it was up at battery voltage, that may not still be the case, but the two and a half volts, it seemed to work. So anyways, that's just a side note. Try it out if you run into that situation and see where it gets you. Most of the time, we can't have voltage on the circuit if we're going to be doing ohm checks. Um, and this tool is definitely, if we understand what's going on there with the measurement, it is definitely not meant to assess a circuit's ability to flow a large amount of current. And what's a large amount of current? Uh, that's... It's all relative, right? But if it's doing any amount of work, that's the way I'm going to consider it. <laughs> that's current that's flowing through that circuit that the ohm meter is not going to be capable of telling you whether that circuit can for sure do it or not, right? Now, there is, with, with the testing of the ohm meter, if it fails, you can say for sure the current isn't going to flow, right? And, and we have a lot of tests like this where like, if it fails, it's bad, 100% stop there and address that problem. But if it passes, well, in that case, if we're hoping that that current, that circuit can flow current, it passes that continuity beep test, it doesn't mean that that circuit is 100% good, right? Uh, and I liken that to like the old blue head gasket fluid that you'd use to see if there was uh uh, combustion gases in the cooling system for a head gasket. If that fluid turned yellow, you're done. You, you're tearing into that engine one way or another. There is a combustion leak into the cooling system. But if it stayed blue, it didn't mean that that engine was 100% okay. Um, and it's the same thing with an old meter, right? It's if, if it is OL on that wire that needs to flow current, you've got a problem I and mean, you need to you know, you don't need to do any other tests. You just need to find the open, right? But if it needs to flow current, if it needs to do some work in that circuit, right? We're talking about solenoids, relays, motors, light bulbs, heating elements, anything that does physical work, well, it needs to flow current. And just because it passes the continuity test doesn't mean that it can flow current. And this is where the ohm meter has really gotten a bad rap because within our DTC flow charts that the OEM provides to us for many, many, many years, they've been this way. They're going to have you ohm check every single wire and in a tedious way, a lot of the time, you know, you're pulling connectors apart that you don't necessarily have to, you know, you're stretching your leads across the vehicle 
in one fashion or another to get from one end or the other. And you're solely relying on these continuity checks before you replace a module, right? So you're doing a tedious check that's really not telling you what you need to know, especially if it's like a ground or a power supply wire to a component. And then if all the passes, everything beeps or is supposed to beep, then we put a control module in it without load checking anything, without making sure that those circuits can do work. <laughs> and it was a tedious process, of course, a lot of people are going to hate the ohm meter or just view it as a poor testing method or poor tool because of the way it's been utilized, in my opinion. But again, it all comes back to understanding what this thing can and can't do, and it should not be used to check a circuit that needs to flow current. But we have a lot of circuits on the car where current is a lot less important. And these tend to be circuits that carry information rather than doing work. And when I'm testing circuits on a car, I try to break it down into those two subcategories. There's, uh, you know, some gray areas and some, uh, you know, circuits that maybe you couldn't put into one category or the other. But for the most part on most circuits on cars, I'm going to say it's either a circuit that does work or that sends or carries information from one place to another, like a network, very common. But there's other examples too of like a sensor wire, something like that. And for those wires, while yes, we need a complete circuit and we don't want unwanted resistance, we are much less concerned about the circuit's ability to carry a large amount of current, right? I don't find myself too frequently, if ever, using a headlight bulb to check sensor wires or CAN bus wires. Not to say you couldn't, not to say it's, you know, anything necessarily wrong with doing that, but I don't find myself doing that very often because my thought process is not, hey, can this CAN bus wire carry four amps of current? Because it should never have to. If it If it is under normal operating, you have a problem with that car. But that wire should never have to carry that amount of current. Much, much, much less. I don't even know what the current would be on a CAN bus. You'd need some sort of micro amp clamp to measure that. But it's minuscule, right? And so the wire's ability to carry current, well, that doesn't really matter that much to me. And in the case where the ability to carry a large amount of current doesn't necessarily matter as much. Well, that's where the ohm meter can be a really, really useful tool. But we have to understand what our circuit's meant to do and, again, what the test is capable of telling us. So a couple other things that this is really good for, and, and I'm going to get into a little bit of network stuff if you can't already see it going that way, but I, I just wanted to point out some of the other ways that I use this tool that make it useful and worthwhile for me to have one. Like if mine broke tomorrow, I would go buy another one. The audible continuity check, at least for me being mobile and being by myself a lot of the time is actually really helpful just to make sure, Hey, I've got continuity on this wire or I am on the correct wire. I use it a lot for that when I'm looking through connectors or I have a bunch of wires that in some cases may all be the same color. I can use that continuity check to help me say, okay, yep, I am on the correct wire. If it beeps where I'm hoping it's going to beep. Okay. That pin is the pin I thought it was. Now I can run whatever other test I want to on that circuit if needed, but it's confirmed to me that, yep. Okay. I'm on the correct circuit. So I use it all the time. Um, I'm going to give you a quick example of one where it helped me find an open in a wire that was, spanned a pretty good length on the vehicle, but that audible beep when you're using it, that's so helpful to be able to hear and have a audible confirmation of continuity on a wire. I like that. Um, I like visual too. That's great. But having an audible one makes it easy if you're underneath a dash or underneath the vehicle. Um, I use this board level too, the continuity feature. Uh, trying to trace out a board. So let's say you've got a circuit board that's within a module and it's got two sides to it, right? There's a top and a bottom side and there's components on both on this green printed circuit board. And maybe the component that you want to get to 
So like, let's say it's an EEPROM chip. It's on the top of the board. But in order to get there, you have to destroy part of the module or you risk destroying part of the module to get to that. Or maybe it's just a lot of work. You have to do a lot of meticulous work to remove the cover to this module or maybe you have to drill a hole, but you don't really want to because it kind of looks like a hack thing to do. So I want to get to this chip without doing a ton of work or without destroying the module. Well, what you can do is... You'd, and a lot of times you have to sacrifice a module to do this. You do have to get to that EEPROM chip at least once, but then in the future you wouldn't have to. But you can use your own meter to connect to one leg of that EEPROM, go to the back side of the board and start touching components that you think it might go to until you hear the beep. And sometimes it's surprising where it ends up on the board. But what you can do in that point, in the case of like this EEPROM, if you find all eight legs, or sometimes they're bridged together, so you don't need to find all eight. But if you if you find the correct amount of legs and their connection points on the back side of the board, the next time all you have to do is pop off the back, connect your, your leads for whatever equipment you're using, solder them on there, and then you don't have to remove that top side. You don't have to damage it. You don't have to do all that work. You can read it right through the circuit. Now, there's a whole bunch of other caveats to that as, you know, to whether you can read in circuit and what tool you're using. That's that's a whole nother conversation that uh, Mike Christofferson's class can help you out on that. But that's where I use it is tracing out the circuits on a board uh, when I'm doing that type of work. Uh, it's been really helpful. Building some cables, um, it's been helpful for me as well. Utilizing it there. Um, if I have a fuse box that I have power on a fuse, but I don't have power coming out of that fuse box, I'll run some ohm checks on the fuse box. And usually if I'm to that point doing that, it proves what I need to know that like, okay, there's no continuity here. It's open inside of this fuse box. So just some areas where I use that audible continuity check. Um, the ability to actually measure resistance is definitely helpful. Um, now, again, sometimes we'll measure a load and measure the resistance of the load. And sometimes, I mean, hey, if you have a motor or solenoid and it's shorted, it's going to show you that for sure. And then that component is junk, throw it away, get a new one. But again, in a situation where load needs a fair amount of current to operate, which is most loads, you know, most motor solenoids, light bulbs, whatever, they're going to take a fair amount of current to operate. Statically measuring the resistance like that isn't a true test of that load, in my opinion. But again, it's a, uh, hey, if it fails, it's definitely junk. If it passes, uh, you probably are going to want to do some other tests uh, to confirm whether or not it's good. Um, but the ability to actually measure the amount of resistance of things is really helpful. And here's where I've used this in diagnostics. A lot of switches, and not so many anymore, but you do still see some. If you look at the diagram, it will actually show you the amount of resistance for the switch in each position. And these are a lot of like dashboard and steering wheel buttons will have various resistances and they'll change the voltage, which instructs the module on what button you're pressing. But they give you the resistive value in the diagram a lot of the time. And so you could use the ohm meter to check to see, does it match exactly what it says on the diagram? Um, so that's another uh, place where I would use that. Um, you know, same thing on measuring devices such as like a throttle position sensor that's actually a potentiometer, obviously with... Uh, the uh, electric throttle bodies less less common, but you do have uh, like rheostats in uh, fuel level sensors that you can measure as well. And so for measuring devices, you can use that. Um, now, the, the last thing I'm going to mention here, and this is kind of the big one and why I really think this is a powerful tool. And, and maybe I'm in disagreement with some people here because uh, this is kind of where, you know, you hear a lot of the time is, you know, an ohm meter doesn't have purpose in this type of testing. And I'm talking about network checks, right? That there's no reason to do an ohm check on a network. Now I'll, I'll die on this hill that if it's a daisy chain network, which is most common on GM, but they are used in other manufacturers and scenarios, 
if it's a daisy chained network, I think the ohm check is an extremely powerful tool that tells you so much about the network. And I think you should do it first before you even bother scoping it, in my opinion. And then I'll explain a little bit why. But when I'm talking about the daisy chain network, um, again, there's a diagram on YouTube, but if you think about four modules in a row and they all need to be connected on the network, you could run separate wires to each one and create your net network that way. But what GM and again, some other manufacturers will do is they'll run the CAN wires from one module. And if you think the module on the left in a row of four, they'll run it out of the first one and then into the second one. So there's, it's a CAN network. So there's a high and a low. So there's two wires leaving that first module. And then there's two wires entering the second module. But what they're going to do is they're going to short that CAN bus across to another two pins that leave the second module. So now you have four CAN wires or an in, a through, and an out that are going to leave and go to the next module. Do the same thing there. And then they're going to go to the final, the fourth module where there's only two lines going into it, right? So it's an in through out and the in and out is a little bit deceptive because the can traffic is really, it's going both ways. If you want to consider it that it's really, it's happening everywhere on the network at the same time as, as far as we're concerned. And so the in through out is a little deceiving, but when you think about the structure of the network and diagnostics, I think it's helpful to think in throughout or upstream downstream. Um, at least for me, it helps me conceptualize how they have it constructed and where I am within the network, because that often becomes really important in figuring out where I need to go or where the problem is. But anyways, again, real simple. It's just four modules in a row using in throughout. So we've got two wires leaving the first four wires on the second, four wires on the third, and then two wires on the one on the right, which should be the fourth module. And then we can have those branch off to like a DLC so that we can connect the scan tool to it as well. But I'm going to, if I have this type of network on a car and I have an issue with the network, right? That's probably why I'm there. I'm going to ohm check this first before I scope it. Now I'll check to see, like I mentioned, is there voltage on there and Try, turn the key off and wait for it to go to sleep before I do this. But then I'm going to ohm check it and I'm going to see if I have 60 ohms on a CAN network, right? And CAN networks are extremely popular. So I often deal with them. And at least where I'm at in the US, General Motors are extremely popular. And all of them have CAN bus. I mean, even going back, I did a 2005 the other day that had a CAN bus on it. Um, and they almost all seem to use the same daisy chain structure. Now I have run into a handful of them over the years and particular networks that don't set it up that way. They use the traditional bus style where it's basically just two wires and then it's going to branch off and go to each one of the modules. And when we're measuring that 60 ohms, we're measuring the two 120 ohm resistors in parallel, right? And in a traditional bus style, uh, think of it like a kind of like a star, right? Like you'd have a, a central point and then legs that go out to each module. If you measure 60 ohms, which is your two 120s in parallel, really all you can say is that the network is not shorted together and it is complete at least to the two modules of terminating resistors. But you could have an open in many other places in the network in a traditional bus style and your ohm check would not show you that, right? You could have an open network and you could still have 60 ohms on a traditional bus style. So, I mean, if I'm doing a network diagnosis, I'm gonna look at the diagram and see how it's constructed. And while I might still utilize an ohm check in those cases, depending on what I'm after, or what I'm finding, if I'm doing this, on a daisy chain style network, it's telling me so much more about the circuit. If I do this on a daisy chain network and I get 60 ohms for the network, I can say 
with 100% confidence that every module on the network on that CAN network is plugged in and making contact all the way through, in, throughout, and that there are no opens anywhere in the circuitry, the connectors, the pin fitment, the modules themselves. There are no opens. Everything's plugged in and it's not shorted together. I can say all of that from a test that took me five seconds once I pull out my meter. I mean, yeah, you got to wait for it to go to sleep. That's probably going to be the longest part of that test. So it's a really low cost test. I mean, the no meter is literally a cheap tool to buy, but it doesn't cost you much time or effort, especially if it's connected to the DLC, which a lot of GMs are. There are some with gateway modules that changes things a bit, but if it's at your DLC right under the dash, you're there already because you were probably using your scan tool. Connecting an ohm meter and getting that measurement of that network is it's so easy to do, and it tells you so much about these networks, right? Now, if I get 60 and I've got communication problems on a GM daisy chain style, <clears throat> well, now I'm moving to my scope or other methods to diagnose what's going on, for sure. There is lots and lots of network problems where the scope is the tool, and that's it. Like, you're not going to get there, or you're going to get there very, very, very slowly and difficultly without the scope. But if I see well, more or less than 60 ohms, depending on what we find, with my ohm meter, I rarely even pull out the scope. I don't bother scoping it. I, I don't see a point to it, right? If I get 120 ohms across there, I know there's an open. I just have to find the open, and I can use my ohm meter to do that. I, I could maybe use a scope too, but I usually don't pull out the scope if, if I find that on a daisy chain network. And... I mean, I'm mobile, so efficiency is key. And the less tools I pull out, the better, because it just means there's that many more tools I have to put away. And anyways, if I see 120, I'm usually not scoping it. I'm just like, well, I got to find the open. So I'm going to use a diagram to do that. Um, quick case study on a vehicle to kind of demonstrate this. It's a 2018 uh, Chevy Silverado. I just did this one the other day, actually. Um, I've been getting a lot of network stuff and a lot of GM open network stuff. Maybe that's why I'm talking about this. Um, there was uh, multiple communication codes that were stored in the EBCM analog brake controller and the power steering modules. And there was a couple other like sub modules that were showing like invalid data from these modules. But those were the modules that really had the codes that were loss of communication to steering angle sensor. Um, and there was a couple other things. There, there was a couple other modules. We'll actually get to that in just a second here. Um, it was the power steering control module, the electronic brake control module, the steering angle sensor, and then the uh, airbag module. That was the other one I was forgetting, the airbag module that were setting codes for communication and implausible data and things like that. So after doing a little bit of digging and service information, looking at my modules that had codes for communication, I wanted to see, well, what network are they on? Well, the analog brake controller specifically is on multiple networks. And this is something to consider if you're doing network stuff is ask yourself, like, what network does the scan tool talk to said module through? Or does it at all? Is there a gateway module? Or does it talk on a high-speed CAN scan tool to module, but then the module communicates with other modules on a separate network? And it's something to consider because in this case, I was scratching my head to where like, well, how come I can talk to my EBCM, but the EBCM is saying it has communication issues with these other modules, which I can also talk to. Well, that comes down to how your scan tool is actually communicating with these modules. And there are multiple networks, but not so much of the point, the point of this case study, but I have these codes and I look and all of these modules that are showing problems exist on the chassis expansion bus. Right, so this is your airbag module, which is on other networks, steering wheel angle sensor, which is actually only on this particular network. The serial data gateway is connected. And then we have a power steering control module and then an electronic brake control module. Uh, there is a suspension control module option. My truck that I was working on didn't have that. 
but they operate on a CAN bus and it's a daisy chain style, just like I described. And there's also two modules with terminating resistors within them. And you want to know where those are at if you're going to utilize this type of testing. If you don't know where these are at, which sometimes is a problem, it does make this more challenging. But if you know where they exist within the circuit or within the modules, um, you can do quite a bit with that amount of information. And we're actually going to utilize this here. But in this circuit... They exist in the inf inflatable restraint module, the airbag module, and then in the EBCM. So those are the two ends of the network that only have two wires going to them, a high and a low for the CAN. The rest of them, the steering angle, the gateway, the power steering control, they have two in and two out or four connections there for the CAN because uh, those, those are your in through out style modules. So... I'm going to do my ohm check and see what I've got here before I really do anything else, before I scope it, uh, before I start digging into anything. I know I've got a communication problem, at least based on the codes that I see. And I'm going to go to pins 12 and 13 on the DLC. So for this GM, this Chevy truck, pins 12 and 13 are my chassis expansion bus. And again, it's important to understand well, what network do I need to look at? And I don't know for sure yet if this is the, the actual network I need to be on. Maybe there's some sort of gateway problem or something like that. But all of the modules that have codes and problems exist on this network. It's going to be the first one I'm going to check. And then, I don't know, if I need to move my meter over two spots in the DLC, it's, it's not going to hurt me. So anyways, I ohm check it. I get 122 ohms on this, which is pretty close to 120. So what that means to me immediately is that I have an open on the network somewhere and I don't need to bother to scope this. I just need to figure out where my open is. That's it. So how am I going to approach this? I'm in a big network like this that spans the length of the vehicle, which a lot of networks do. I'm going to look at the diagram and I'm going to try my best to find some type of centralized location or connector that I can go to and I can start testing here. And I'm also going to utilize the location of the DLC in reference to the terminating resistors. Okay. Now, again, I'll try to explain this to you the best I can audio only, but imagine if I was measuring at the DLC and the DLC where it's connected in the network is closer to the inflatable restraint module than it is the EBCM. And between the DLC and the EBCM is a connector, okay? And there's other stuff involved, but there's one connector in particular. It's X134, and it's between the DLC and the EBCM. I'm going to unplug this connector. Again, it's kind of centralized, loca located within the network itself, but it's also, and this is a factor for me, is easy to get to. Uh, it's right up on the front cross member. I can reach under the hood, grab it, and unplug it. I'm leaving my meter connected to the DLC for this, and I want to see what happens. Okay, this will prove to me what side of the network my open is on. Is it towards the inflatable restraint module, or is it towards the electric brake control module? Now, it could be either at this point, because all I know is that I am reading one of those two resistors when I get 120 ohms, and then there's an open going somewhere to the other one, but I would like to know some direction, like what side of the network. And you could pick one of the two terminating modules if they're easy to access, but for me, they weren't. The ABS is under the by the frame rail, and the airbag module is, I think it's under the center console on this one, and I'm not going to dig those up. I'm just going to pick a connector in the middle and understand my ohm meters or the DLC's reference to where I'm disconnecting it. So I unplug it, and I don't get any change. And I know by looking at the diagram, if that connector is unplugged and I've separated that network there, my DLC still has connection to the airbag module, assuming there's no opens, but now I know there's no opens because it's still reading 120 ohms. So having that connector disconnected and understanding the diagram, I know that that 120 has to be the airbag 
And I also know the open has to be in the direction of the EBCM. Okay, so the other side of that network. That's the only way that that works. And so now I really do have some good direction and where the open is, it, I have to go towards the EBCM. Now, what side of the connector I just disconnected is the open on? I still don't know that. But what I can do is I can check each side of the network at that connector because um, the um, the network actually goes in on two wires and comes out on two wires of this connector. Something to be careful of if you're separating connectors, trying to locate and open in a network, you may separate it in two spots. So be aware of that. It's like unplugging a mod, one of these modules on the CAN network. You've unplugged it in two spots, right? There's an in and an out. And I, I'm using those terms loosely, but just so you understand, there's four wires going in. It's the same on a lot of these connectors. And it is on this one. But that's helpful to me because I can measure the high and the low going towards my airbag module. And then on the other side of that connector, like one would be on the male side, on the female side, I can measure the two going to the EBCM. And that's going to, again, point me in the correct direction. So I go towards the airbag module. I got my 120 at this connector under the hood. Okay. All of that's good. I don't have to worry about any of that. And again, think of how powerful this is. This little tool with a nine volt battery has assessed the entire length of a vehicle of CAN bus wire through all of the connectors and the harnesses and the modules, you plug it in and it assesses that for you just like that. That's why I think this is really cool is its ability to do this real quickly. Now, are there other ways to do this? Yes, sure. But this is my preferred way and I think it works really well. Now, going the other way on this connector the other side towards the EBCM, I'm expecting to see OL and I'll still do the test. Now I know what I should, what I'm expecting to see, not what I should see, but what I'm expecting to see is OL. And that's what I get when I put the terminals across there. Okay. And you should, anytime you do any test, you should have an expected result. If you're not expecting something, there's not a whole lot of point in doing the test, right? There should be a desired result. Um, or if you know, like you're heading in the right direction in this case, I'm pretty sure I'm going to see an OL and open and I do, but if you're not expecting anything, rethink your test a anyways. Um, so now I, I know I need to go in the direction of the EBCM and using a extended reel, I plug into the two wires up at this connector and I go down to the EBCM and do a visual inspection on the connector and the harness going to it because it's in a rough place. It's underneath the vehicle. Uh, definitely, you know, I, I've kind of got the feeling right now like it might be around this area. I've seen some other circuit issues with Silverados in this harness area. This truck had been off-roading, so there was a lot of dirt and rocks and stuff underneath. And, you know, so visual inspection doesn't really get me anywhere. Um, so I decided to unplug the module. And this is a little bit of a risk here. Um, reason being is it could be a pin fitment issue. And when I unplug that connector, you risk disturbing that pin fitment. And then you may not be able to recreate that program or that, that problem again. But um, at this point, I decided I'm going to disconnect this and I'll do some ohm checks from one end to another. Um, and this is where, you know, that flow chart tedious stuff may, it might overlap here a little bit, but I just, I had my meter out. I had it set on the continuity beep setting and I checked each one of the wires from that connector to the ABS connector. And really all this is telling me is it's confirming an open, which I suspect I have, but it's also going to show me which wire, if there is, I mean, it could be both, I suppose, but it's going to show me which wire and confirm that there's an open in the harness, not in the module side. And when I do this, I do get OL and I get, I get it on the blue yellow wire. Um, the next thing I did was I used the meter and I moved along the wire in a couple of places that I could access the circuit. Uh, it goes along this harness and the frame rail and I very gently pierced the wire so that I can make connection. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to put a little bit of silicone or something on the wire to seal that up. But I find this is the easiest way to track down the open is I'm going to 
pierce the wire in a few different places to see, do I get the beep? If I get the beep, I move closer to the EBCM. And I do that. And eventually I find that there's a open wire. It's the blue yellow, right where the ABS harness goes over the top of the frame rail and then goes, it tees into the main harness. That's where the issue was. And it looked like somebody had been in there before. There was a couple other wires that were chafed a little bit, but this one got the brunt of it and had the blue crusties. So it opened up. Um, this took me uh, maybe half hour to 45 minutes to get through this and figure out where the open was. And again, the ability of the tool to assess that entire network and to tell you so much, I mean, even if the test passes to tell you so much with one quick, simple check, I just, I don't see myself doing GM CAN bus stuff without it. So anyways, uh, I, I think that's pretty much it for the ohm meter. I, I don't need to really talk any more about it, but I just wanted to get that out there because uh, I, I definitely hear repetitively, you know, some, you know, saying that it is a bad test or throw it in the garbage or whatever. And I, I definitely think it has its place as long as you understand what it's doing. Um, that's it for the episode. Um, if you would like to win a free automotive diagnostic podcast t-shirt, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or comment on the YouTube channel. And at the end of every month, we'll put your name into a drawing and we will announce the winners on the show. So listen for your name. If you hear it, get a hold of me, give me your t-shirt size and address, and I'll get that mailed out to you. But other than that, that's it. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate it. Let's all get out there, start fixing the world one car at a time.